thank you thank you dear muhammad and uh and uh, great uh, from your side uh, and initiative that you will show us the system uh, run in the bangladesh so just to inform you that we are recording this um, session and we will share it with the all i am so please over to you uh, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, let's start with a brief introduction. So let's let me introduce myself. Then I will ask Abrad to introduce yourself. So we will be jointly presenting and my name is Mohammad Shahnawaj Moshad. So I am uh, working in nutrition section in Bangladesh country office. My portfolio is information system and data governance. I have been working uh, before joining Bangladesh country office. I've been working in the Rohingya refugee crisis in Cox's Bazar. So the system we are presenting here, it is developed for the Rohingya response and being implemented in Cox's Bazar. And some of this lesson learned, we try to accommodate in the national system. So um, I'll now invite uh, Abraha to introduce yourself. Abraha, over to you. Okay, good afternoon. Since we are in Bangladesh, it's afternoon time five. And my name is Avrat. I am the ICT specialist who is responsible to the overall ICT operation as well as the T44 card version for the whole Bangladesh office. I've been in Bangladesh for the last uh, two and a half years. And before that, I was in Ethiopia. And originally, I'm from Ethiopia, over from my side. Thank you. Thank you, Abrat. So now I will start presenting. So our presentation is divided into two components. So one is programmatic development and other is how it is uh, incorporated in the technologies. So there are two sides. So for let me first uh, present on the uh, programmatic aspects, then I will invite Abrahat to present the technological sides. Um, so let's uh, give an overview about the context. So uh, this emergency nutrition information management system, in short, we call it any. It was uh, designed for the Rohingya refugee crisis in Cox's Bazar. So as you might, as some of you might know, uh, a massive influx was happened in 2017 where more than a million Rohingya population crossed to Myanmar to Bangladesh and they settled in two uh, small sub districts in Bangladesh, that is northern part of Bangladesh in Cox's Bazar. And about this one million Rohingya population, are, uh, over half of the half of them are children. There, and uh, the malnutrition rate was quite high among these children. So around uh, one every fifth child is uh, malnourished, either. Uh, wasted or chronically uh, standard. So at the beginning, the emergency nutrition services were provided by different UN agencies and implemented by several implementing partners. Initially, there were more than 20 implementing partners and they all, all together, they are provided uh, the nutrition services they provided in 34 demand Rohingya camps. So these two uh, sub districts, there are 34 Rohingya camps where uh, all the partners, they, uh, all the refugees are settled and uh, emergency nutrition services were provided uh, to 106 scattered uh, nutrition sites. So, as you can see, uh, each of this uh, camp they have more than three nutrition sites, and these they are providing OTP, TCP, and BCP services. They are not integrated, and they are provided through separate or distinguished uh, nutrition sites. And there are huge. Uh, later on, we observed there is huge overlapping of services, and uh, a child or mother. Uh, had to go had uh, screened several times and they had to go different service points to different to receive different services and also 
if you look into the information part, so I provided a screenshot where you can see all the registers and reporting tools they are used. Uh, they were uh, used to collect the information. So there were more than 40 different registers they used to collect all the nutrition services data and uh, and each facility that to spend more than three to four hours daily to complete all the recordings and reporting. However, the data they collected, they are not mainly used for performance tracking. They are used for mainly uh, uh, activity tracking. So also there are no harmonized recording and reporting tools among partners. So uh, and also one of the critical area was missing. That is no prevention and promotion activity data was recorded. Only the curative or service uh, uh, curative data was recorded through this reporting system. So identify uh, when these issues were identified uh, the series of consultation was happened uh, among all the partners uh, led by the nutrition sector and also the ICG because in Cox's budget there is an intersector agency group so they are leaded they, they led the whole emergency response and under that different clusters were formed so one of the cluster is emergency nutrition cluster so through this uh, emergency nutrition sector or cluster, all the emergency responses were provided. So it was the sector who identified the issue and took the initiative to design and develop an emergency nutrition information system so that all the uh, services were harmonized and, uh, and they could report through a single uh, unified information system. So an, another big agenda or objective was to uh, replace the manual or conventional information uh, filling system with a digital recording and reporting system. So to do so, there were several listings uh, that the NN system had to grow through to operationalize the whole system. So first, the service delivery mechanism has to be standardized because uh, there are more than 20 partners and each partner they are having their own activities but those are not standardized so the first the standardization need to be done and then all of the services it has to be prioritized and then a minimum service delivery package has to be developed and back to back a uh, common uh, and monitoring and reporting framework has to be developed that was the second step and on third on third, um, aligning with the monitoring framework, a uh, nutrition information system will be developed, has to be developed, and that will be an integrated one. Meaning each and every partner, what are the services they are providing, they have to be reported. It have to be reported through a common uh, reporting set, uh, system, and no separate or parallel uh, system will be allowed. So the whole system was laid by the sector so that the, every partner can uh, were brought under one umbrella and then uh, this can be executed. And also uh, uh, one specific focus was given for data for decision making because previously the data was collected. They were not used for uh, decision making or performance tracking or monitoring. So commonly uh, all the partners data was gathered into one central system and then from where the service delivery performance were regularly monitored and, and that was strategically used for uh, corrective actions. Let me um, go through each of these steps. So as you can see in the map, so the first step was rationalization, harmonization and localization. So by rationalization, we meant there were more than 106 standalone sites so through rationalization, it was identified only 44 integrated nutrition facility is required. So by integrated nutrition facility, it is the one step service delivery point. So meaning in one umbrella, a mother or child can receive DSAP, BSAP and OTP services. So from the rationalization, you can see the, the number of facility has been reduced almost half. And then uh, it was discovered that the cost required for implementation, it was it varies among partners, especially between the international uh, organization and the national organization. So at that time, it was the government priority to nationalize or localize so that uh, 
the implementing partners, uh, uh, the international implementing partners, uh, number of international implementing partners has been reduced substantially. It was 11 and then uh, it came down to uh, three national implementing partners. As you can see uh, from the right to right, right to maps, the number of implementing partners has been reduced from uh, international to national. So, um, so also the service delivery approach was standardized. So meaning uh, the integrated nutrition facility, which becomes a one stop service delivery points that provides all comprehensive nutrition services uh, and uh, that includes um, uh, targets children under five years of age and uh, pregnant and lactating mothers. And under the community based management of adequate malnutrition services, uh, it provides OTP services, TSAP services, BSAP services, and also SBCC services for IYCF and maternal nutrition and other child nutrition services. That means it covers both preventive and curative services and also sensitive programs. And uh, at one of the biggest integration was uh, the services provided by the uh, partners. It, uh, it uh, not only limited to the facility, it also integrated community services as well. So the integrated nutrition facilities it, in its catchment areas, it provides both uh, curative and preventive services. And uh, through harmonization, one of the biggest step was to cost sharing between even partners so that uh, um, um, so that the the double dipping can be reduced. So and uh, through the cost sharing, one fifth of the operation cost was reduced. And uh, this is this is the common framework that was developed for the uh, emergency response. So it is aligned with the national uh, monitoring and reporting framework for nutrition services, where they have three uh, four different layers at input level and uh, output level outcome and impact level so overall the objective was to reduce the stunting and wasting and also the anemia because the anemia prevalence was quite high among the adolescent and pregnant mothers and also for the children around more than half of the children were anemic and uh, it was quite high around 40 to 50 percent among the pregnant mothers so the intervention was uh, um, as the uh, under the KOT part, it has like OTP and also the preventive part uh, for supplement micronutrient supplementations and also the uh, ANC services and maternal nutrition services were strengthening, and as well as um, um, for uh, growth monitoring services at the community level. So these all at the output level it was included, and also um, also for the supplies. So at the at the facility level, it was ensured the supply wasn't quite a big issue because uh, it, this nutrition services was provided through 34 different uh, services, the facilities, and those are like one in uh, one facility per camp. So, uh, and all and service uh, supply line um, assurance was quite a big challenge during COVID time. So this supply system was included part of the uh, information system so that supply and any shortage or any uh, expiry can be easily monitored and the supply can be ensured on time. Uh, so the journey, as I mentioned, the uh, any or the information system development journey started in 2019 and the whole development process took almost four years and uh, finally the final version was completed in 2023 and uh, it was really challenged by the COVID during COVID time uh, several issues were encountered and uh, the system has to go through several contextual uh, challenges uh, system has to adapt with adapt to mitigate some other contextual challenges so um, I will briefly uh, tell you what are the challenges. So uh, let me take you then to the challenges and lesson learned uh, slide. So, um, so the several revision were made to the system. The initial prototype was developed in 2019 and then uh, uh, 
in 2022 there was this rationalization ex service rationalization exercise was happened so uh, according to that uh, the whole uh, NM system was redesigned and then in uh, 2020 there was this covid uh, uh, emergence and resurgence of covid and the also sequencing of lockdown that had a negative impact all, all on the overall implementation and uh, the covid 19 actually disrupted the services and also there were several adaptation um, covid adaptation that had to addressed by the system so the one of the big issue was um, to identify the risk factors for example the uh, weight height measurement so that was actually dropped for the uh, to as a mitigation measure so instead the MOAC based uh, um, approach was adopted and also for the uh, uh, for the supply RUTF and RUCF supplies it was uh, weight based dosing uh, they actually reduced uh, stopped the weight based dosing instead they are using uh, age based dosing so there were several adopt changes in the protocol and accordingly the system has to revise so that uh, this and also for the MUAC, the uh, threshold or criteria was revised. So previously it was 115, it was increased up to 120 for the SAM management. And uh, the system has to adapt with that. And also the, for the weekly ratio was revised to the fortnightly rations. So all these changes has to be adapted in the system so that the system became more uh, dynamic. And also, uh, as I mentioned, there are some contextual challenges. So uh, time from time to time, the, there was uh, conflicts layered up in the camps and uh, to uh, mitigate with those situations, the government took several steps, like there was this communication blackouts and uh, the whole internet connection was disrupted. So the system has to adapt from online-based reporting to offline-based reporting. So all these uh, uh, challenges, uh, the our enim system is uh, encompassed uh, mitigation measures to address all these challenges and and all and the final revision it was completed in 2023 that also included the features of data securities which abret will talk later when she is explaining the system architecture and designs and um, the, so finally what are the key features in the system the, it has um, uh, integrated service tracking system and also uh, individual beneficiary tra service tracking for individual beneficiaries. It can actually track uh, for each beneficiary longitudinally up to five months, uh, up to five years. And also a uh, beneficiary history is kept in the system so that any uh, 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 so any uh, data that, uh, for example, the relapse and also any uh, information that we need, we can actually, the system can have that information. And also it has, as I mentioned, the supply system was a critical issue. So it has inventory management. And also for the reporting purposes, it has aggregated data. And overall it made the entire information or data collection system paperless. And uh, also the uh, key information was visit, visualized through uh, data visualization temp platforms and it has several uh, several data uh, separate data visualization platforms which is actually role based so for example the facility manager they have access to more detailed information whether the area supervisor he has more summarized information and the event partners they have like information on key performance indicators and as well as sector so uh, data visualization uh, templates or tools were designed for uh, considering the uh, different service providers or user roles. So finally, uh, the final revision was completed in 2023, which uh, includes uh, all these programmatic uh, as, um, mitigation measures and also uh, also the data protection features, which uh, I would like now. I would like to invite Abrad to present. So Abrad, it's over to you. Thank you. So, uh, as uh, Moshe says, I will be presenting on the technological aspect of this system, uh, which uses for program implementation of nutrition program implementation and current tracking and intervention. 
So if you can go to the next slide, please. Uh, do I have control? Okay, yes. So I'll start from the high level overview of the system architecture. So this system, as in, you know, as it's shown in this diagram, it has two components. I don't know if I have updated it. The updated version is not replicated. And as it can be seen from this diagram, the system is designed and developed as an active architecture with a data layer. So there are six rectangular boxes. The left hand side is one application, the right hand side is another application. They are interacting and exchanging data through API. So I'll start from the left hand side. So the left hand side is an application and which is a core component of the application, which is used to collect, track, collect data of beneficiaries, individual information, track, monitor, and it also performs, allow users to perform a certain transaction in terms of inventory management, nutrition supplies, in terms of following and tracking of individual beneficiaries. So this is a core part of the system. And the right hand side is only responsible for data visualizations. In terms of user groups who are accessing the two applications, the data visualization has a broader audience and the data, the core data collection tool, we call it data collection in data visualization tools, the data collection tool mostly access by user who are on daily basis interacting with beneficiaries. So I'll, I'll go a bit detail to the different layers of the system architecture. And the system architecture has three layers, as I said, this has presentation application layer in data layer. In the presentation layer, which is responsible to allow users to interact with the system, it has two components, the mobile app and the web app. The mobile app is the main interface by, as I said, most of the community workers interacting with the beneficiaries. So directly through this mobile app, they collect beneficiary information, they update beneficiary information, they manage their nutrition supplies. And so we call this is the part where the main data entry and modification takes place. And it doesn't store any data. And the web application is, an, is developed using PSP and mainly used by system admins to manage users, create roles, or different creating different profiles or nutrition supply items and configuring the system. And the web, the mobile app, so as it is also has authorization and authentication, so it preferably it has to be used by tablet. We say that because there are several activities performed through the mobile app. And the application layer, it is, it has, uh, in terms of technological, it uses Laravel as a framework and uh, it's developed, as I say, it's it's it's, uh, it's web Apache server and mainly serves as middle layer interacting between the presentation layer and the data layer. For the database, as you can see, it, it stores data and it's a relational database because my screen size. When it comes to the right hand side, which is a, another separate, completely separate application, it has Three layers. It's a presentation layer is responsible to visualize data and present data for the decision maker mostly. So similar to any application, it has deep, deep data visualization component with a flexibility to narrow down or to have filter different filters to visualize or to export data. It has also a data export functionality. And the data visualization in the data, which is displayed in this presentation, layer is supposed to be nearly real time. 
And the application layer is the one which is responsible to interact with the core enum system to pull aggregated data through secured API. So this the same application layer is the one which is responsible to do data visualization log logic. You may be asking why you have a separate visualization and an app to do only data visualization. And the, the main application, individual information is stored. So to protect the individual and identifying information, so the design is made in such a way that, and, and also as I mentioned in the beginning, the audiences are a bit different. So this is a separate one, which has be access openly accessible through web, and that is more a secure one. So the main intention of this app is to provide insight for decision maker, for program managers, while ensuring no sensitive personal information is exposed. So that's why we have two layers of applications. If you go to the next slide, please. Yeah. So having said that, so having those applications, how does a deployment architecture looks like? So this system can be operationalized in offline or online mode. In the online mode, the mobile application mainly, so the web application, and as well as a mobile application can be accessed offline or online. The web application offline is a different perspective. And for the mobile application, if it is online and similar to any online and mobile applications, different actors, which are like the supervisor, the distribution point person, the storekeeper, the medical person, or the person who will be sitting and measuring the uh, vital signs of the child or a mother, they will access the app, perform in a data. If, if some, when the mother or the child arrives to the facility, they will register that information if the, that's the first time visit, or if it is not the first time visit, they use any ID to fetch the, pre, the previously registered information and perform whatever activities they have to do and update the data and submit it. As they do it, because everyone has a different role, when they submit, they have a certain layer of ac ac uh, access. When they submit, the next person also, again, will put that information, continue doing their own activity. And everything is done online. So the assumption is everyone should have full-fledged internet connection. For the case of, because the middle one is, is shows the, the main server, which has the application and the database and everything, which is a Apache server. And the right-hand side, the deployment is offline because, in, you know, in practically, not every facility have internet connection. Some few facilities have internet connection and some of them even they don't have power supply. So because of that, this offline modality was a requirement. So for the offline uh, configuration or de deployment configuration, uh, a lightweight local area network is set up and also a, a local server, which we call it facility-based server, will be configured, which is almost a replica of the main central server. So the mobile apps will be connected to the facility. So the applications, instead of like, unlike the online apps, uh, the online users, the users who are operating in the facility where there is no internet, they connect their mobile app to the facility server. So all interactions are restricted within the facility. So they, they do exactly the same thing but this data will be saved at a facility-based local server. But then, once in a day, the supervisor or 
the responsible person has to take that facility based local server. We usually use a high performance laptop, has to take that laptop to a place where there is internet connectivity and synchronize the data to the central database because unless we synchronize it and transfer data, so many data inconsistencies will happen. So sometimes there is transfer of memory sharing from one location to another. And there is also a need because we have data visualization app which relies solely on the central database to fetch in data from the central database through API. So due to that daily on daily, in daily basis, the, the facility-based local server needs to synchronize the data to and flow from the central database. So this is overall how the application can be operationalized. It's offline, it could be online. Especially the offline one is it's, it's really a requirement considering the setup of the facilities at a running account. Can we go to the next slide, please? Okay, this is uh, a bit of a repetition, but it shows it shows the data flow diagram. So as it is in, shown in the previous slide, there is offline and online deployment modality. So for the data flow, so the green, the one in the green sheet at the bottom is, is representing the central database, which will be accessible through internet. And the one in the gray one is the offline one. Again, the, the green one is the online. So when it is offline, as I explained it before, it goes to the local uh, facility-based local database on daily basis, it will be synchronized to the main server. And then for all users who are accessing the system live online, they will directly interact, fetch, update, register information, exchange data. So the central database has a, a capability to auto-generate aggregate monthly report. This is a standard template our nutrition colleagues use it to report the program implementation progress or the individual. So this is not individual information, it's aggregated data. But there is also one, and then this aggregated data is the one, so the system automatically generates from all the data in terms of offline and online mode, it automatically generates the monthly report, and that monthly report will be passed to data visualization servers through secure API. And the data visualization server also it's not open to everyone, but it's accessible for auto authenticator or authorized users, but it has a broader audience relative to the main server. And there is an extension on the left side, which is the yellowish box historical data and manual report. Can you go back? I don't, okay, it's there. I thought you should jump to the next slide. So the manual, so why this extension happens is sometimes there are also facilities who cannot who, who do not have any of the setup offline or online so what will happen is they will have paper-based system so from their paper-based system they will have monthly aggregated report they prepare the monthly aggregated report they import it to the main in in core system and then all aggregated data go to the visual, data visualization server through the core in system, which means the aggregated data will be accessible from one point. And instead of having one Excel here, another Excel there, analyzing it and then keeping it in different laptop, and which also is a security risk. So that is the monthly aggregate, and also some that one of the 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 requirement, I think it was, I, I was not there, but one of the requirements was historical visualization of historical data. So the data visualization server, it has only interaction with the core in its system, but the historical data can be also imported to in its system so that the data visualization server takes that data and show the trend 
or you know the you know what is the progress of the nutrition interventions throughout you know the last five years or six years. That's how the data workflow looks like. Can you go to the next slide, please? Okay, this is a template, so I'm not going to explain it. These are the, the templates which are used to report as an aggregated information. So I will uh, talk uh, for a few minutes, I'll be talking about security by design. When this system is developed, so we followed a certain you know, standard procedure, UNICEF standard procedures to secure individual identifier information. So. After you know, under normal condition, when you fall, when when there is any digital programming or T four D application, so once the T O R is finalized and you know the vendors is on board, the class A assessment is performed. What information will be stored? Because we are from the T O R itself, we know what is uh, what the information will be stored. What will be accessing it? What will be the features of this application? So from that, the class assessment is done, the recommendation is shared to the vendors and it's embedded in the service document and following that the implementation is done based on the SRS. The SRS has all the recommendation from the class assessment and the implementation is progressed based on the definition of SRS security. And then the third level, which we have exceptionally uh, we went through is post development assessment or post deployment assessment. And after the, the system is deployed or finalized, we had another third party vendor and performed vulnerability and penetration testing iteratively. So, for the API, for the mobile app, and for the web application. So, this security test, vulnerability test, is done iteratively in a way that First, the vendor, we just gave the URL and the web app, they did penetration test without any credential. And they gave us a report and that report is passed to the vendor so that they will amend the recommended security measures. And then we gave credential again and through that credential, they do the same thing for both API, mobile app and application. So we went through a very rigorous process and the code is adjusted as per the recommendation. So that's what we call security by design because the system stores individual identified information. And especially when it comes to affected community, this is UNICEF standard. We should take the data we scared. Next slide, please. So overall, Passing through all these procedures, the system has this the data anonymization and aggregated data is only accessible for the majority of the users and decision makers. Data is anonymized, data is masked and aggregation to maintain individual privacy and personal information is hidden from an authorized user. And we have also, the system also has access-based control, role-based and attribute-based access control to ensure only authorized user can view, interact, a certain visualization or even for the core in an application. And the APIs are secured because the API is the one which is passing data from the core in a system to the data visualization. MAFA access is also enabled. And also to have another layer of security on the system. If you go to the next slide, I think I'm almost done. Yes, this is just one screenshot of that shows a role based permission for, from the web app. And this is also the role based access control. If we have a different role in the resources, the resources versus the role they have. So this is defined and implemented in the system. I think I'll stop here at this slide because you can just we can stop here. And if you have any question, please feel free to ask.
Thank you. Thank you very much, Muhammad and uh, Abrahid. So yes, uh, over for everyone here. Uh, just if you have any question, uh, just one thing from my side. Uh, yes. Uh, okay, I have seen some of this feature. It is already in DHIS2. You know, for example, offline, online. So, for example, when you design the system, why you didn't take the DHIS2? So why you take these steps to the to develop uh, extra system? Uh, this is from my side. Thank you. But the system is look good. Thank you very much. Um, so one of the so initially it was thought to build the entire module in DHS2, and it was one of the requests from different UN agencies and partners. They wanted to have a separate system and which can accommodate individual tracking and also which will give the data protection, all the data protection and security aspects. And also uh, the system is hosted in the cloud server currently. So they wanted to, for DHS2, it is hosted in the government or national server. So that's why uh, it, the, all the partners, they decided to implement it in a, in a cloud-based system, which is more secure and which is uh, gives um, how to say it, um, other UN partners, because this system, it collects um, individual beneficiary data or verify individual data from UNHCR uh, system, which collects all the individual family registration, which does all the family registration and individual registration, and also the supply side. One of the supply side, it goes to the WFP side because they're providing all their food distribution and all the supplies is through WFP. So the linkage uh, with two different systems, they wanted to have a in a um, standalone uh, platform. So that is um, Enim. And also they wanted to host it in a more secure location and not in the national system. That's why we have to host it in the private server or cloud server. That is Amazon. Right? Currently we are discussing why it can be hosted either in uh, Amazon or Azure, which one the partner prefers. So this is the reason we had to uh, uh, develop this uh, system apart from DHS2. Over. Thank you. Uh, yes, thank you for your response. Uh, Jail then Ahmed. Jala. Okay. Uh, good. Good evening from here. Uh, for me, I, I just wanted to add to the previous question. So regarding the DHIS2, is this system in any way uh, open to? Can it be integrated with the DHIS2? For example, uh, maybe in the other visualization section or in the data collection section, is there any way do you think it's it can be integrated? Because for me, I'm in a place where it is not emergency, so it's not going to be possible to implement the full system. But if it if is there any way you can implement some part of it because it could be integrated or or no option for that? Thank you. Uh, so to answer to that, yes, it can be easily integrated to DHS2 and um, though we are not, uh, so it's for FDMN, like the Rohingya refugee crisis, so, uh, we are using this system. So and the national system is national, uh, DHS2 is for the national system, so that is separate and the government do not want to mix both of the data, but yes, uh, in the DHS2 there are some key uh, summary indicators that government want to know from this response. So those information uh, is linked uh, through API with the system. So once this aggregated or summary information is generated, this information is pushed to the DHS2. Yes, uh, it can be easily integrated through a proper API connection. The, from this system, you can generate the desired indicators and it can send it to the DHS2 for DHS2 national visualization. Yes. That's all from me. Thank you. Uh, Jill. Jill.
Hello, everyone. Yes. Hi, how are you? Uh, sorry, I didn't realize I was the one you were calling <laughs> because it's Gaia. I'm sorry. Gaia, I'm sorry. Yes, yeah, so sorry for that. Um, uh, one of my questions, I think, was the uh, why is it linked to GHI too? I think it will be more easier. And now I'm worried about uh, duplication. I'm worried also about the sustain sustainability. Because as I understood, except I didn't get it well, this data is being collected by hard workers, or is it being collected by uh, the standalone uh, uh, people? Because if it's being collected by hard workers, is, uh, is it not double work for them? And also I was thinking, is there a way maybe to, uh, if we want some special analysis that uh, maybe GHI2 cannot produce, maybe use, uh, make sure these indicators are found in the monthly uh, the monthly uh, collection tool for the GHI2. Then we link it to another platform uh, or a Power BI platform where we do the, the various analysis we want. And now partners maybe have access to this instead of having two really separate platforms. Is it sustainable? Do we have like a uh, forever fund to maintain this platform? Because also nowadays, crises tend to be protracted crises. So till when are we going to maintain this platform? Do we have the finances? In short, I'm just, there's also some worries in my mind, some questions I'm asking myself. <laughs> thank you. Uh, thank you so much for asking such a, like, timely questions because uh, well in bangladesh uh, our in our national development pro de national program so we do not have the full cmm program because you know for cmm program you it's a product based services you have to have your rutf in place and the, our government do not have the capacity to to procure this amount of RUTF. And now currently they are uh, uh, testing and piloting the uh, local uh, production of RUTF. So this is one part. And also the government system, they don't have the have the resources like the community platforms. The system develop uh, system readiness is not still uh, still under process. So currently we do not have the manpower and the community platforms to deliver the CMAM program. So it is only happening in the uh, Rohingya refugees, uh, Rohingya camps or in, in emergencies where they have plenty of resources to create a community platform and deliver CMAM services through that platform. So this is one of the reason why uh, we had to build a separate system for the emergencies and uh, for community platform uh, and obviously, um, uh, so that there is a lack of manpower and the lack of a, a presence of community platform. So uh, of course, it, there is not a, a duplication of work. And uh, for emergencies, they have a, a separate uh, manpowers. Those are managed by basically uh, uh, pocket NGOs. So they have a then the resources is not coming from the government system. They have like uh, additional financing for that implementation, which is coming through different uh, uh, World Bank or different UN agencies and also different donors. They are actually financing for that. So uh, also in the national system, so DHS2 is mainly facility based services. DHS2 works well when it is it for in our observation in our understanding dhs2 works well with the uh, uh, basically service data but when we talk about the individual uh, data or individual services when we finally want to track the longitudinal track of services there in bangladesh we find it a bit challenging to incorporate all the modules and services because uh, the government is planning to implement uh, low birth weight management at community level, which is through community-based KMC care, and also for uh, uh, wasting management and also for, the, for other maternal health and nutrition services. The government is planning to create a system where uh, they can actually longitudinally track all the services and also uptake of services. So for that, uh, DHS2 
uh, we found DHS2 quite difficult. That's why uh, we are at the national level, we are building a system through OpenSRP that is also uh, open source software, but the system is hosted in the national uh, MS server in the national data center. So uh, the system is operated through that server and through that system, it is possible to track all services, uh, individual level services, and also the uptake of services. Now, so that we have, uh, uh, this is a present development that is in, that started in 2023, and now it is still being developed. By the end of 2024, this uh, open SRP based individual tracking system will be completed, and then hopefully from 2025 onward, it will be implemented. And um, uh, it will not replace DHS2. It will the DHS2 will be there, but that will be up to facility level. The services provided at facility level that will be tracked through DHS2 at any level, like at the primary healthcare or secondary or tertiary level. All the services provided through the facilities and uh, these services will be tracked by DHS2, but at the community level. The community based services that is either uh, community based maternal nutrition, maternal health, or immunization, or uh, low birth weight management, all these services, or wasting management, all these services will be tracked through OpenSRP platform. So now, so that OpenSRP is a modular based system. So this module that we have created in uh, through any, so once government plans to roll out, this module will be part of this. Uh, open SRP software. So it can be easily integrated in the, uh, because they are using the same con uh, plat uh, programming codes, programming base. So it is it will be very easy to uh, um, in include this module. So it will not be an issue. So that is the situation in Bangladesh. Um, I hope it answers some of your questions. Over. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Over to you. <clears throat> thank you, Shabib. I'm not talking anything about the, the system. I'm just uh, saying as a, a general perspective, uh, at least now we have two options. One is ENIM, one is DHS, since they are uh, both covering the health and nutrition information system. And uh, Yes, uh, I must say in terms of data visualization, uh, ENIM is much, much uh, richer for decision making than DHS2. And uh, so already someone already says that it will be difficult to adopt into the emergency says in that case, I can say that uh, the lead time or if ENIM is almost something like plug and play, just uh, uh, and even you need not to change anything code level, you can just uh, change that from the admin pa uh, panel even a general user who, uh, who can uh, just create uh, his or her own, um, email ID, he can change this indicator and just uh, something uh, like a flag and play system, not like the lead time of implementation, not like a DHS2. Uh, this is from the general perspective and from the ENIM team, this is not one of my suggestions since there is a different organization and stakeholder, you already have the uh, security assessment, and uh, I hope you already had the uh, data protection impact assessment. You can also prepare the data protection and uh, DPS to data protection and information sharing protocol since different uh, stakeholders will be using this system. So at which level, who can ask for what type of data? Yeah, in addition to visualization, it will be, uh, I mean, uh, ease for everyone to take the decision. Thank you. Over to you, Shabi. Thank you, thank you. It's clear. So yes, uh, thank you very much uh, for this uh, presentation. And uh, if there is no one, uh, we still have one minute uh, for closing this uh, meeting. But uh, yes, it is great tools. Uh, we like to have uh, different tools, you know, different experience in different country. I remember last year I visit uh, Cox Bazar. I have seen uh, the system there, which is more focused on the camp. It is very good also. So thank you very much for sharing this. We will uh, upload it um, uh, in our uh, this presentation recording in our regions website. Uh, we will share the link with the IMs. 
Uh, just one thing, if they need just to explore um, more of the system, maybe we will put uh, both you, Abrahit and uh, Muhammad, uh, emails so they can contact you for further uh, uh, discussion or for further information they need to implement the system. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for uh, for Thank your you patience hearing. Thank you. Thank you very Thank much. You very